can see some folks on here just uh, giving people a little bit of time. It's just now 7 o'clock. Um, I can see that there's a couple folks in here with me, but I, I don't know who you are. So if you can, I can see comments on the side of the screen if you type something in. So if you want to type in and let me know who's here. I uh, used to, back when I did this, back during um, the pandemic, back during the lockdown, I used to be able to see who joined and when, and I guess they don't do that anymore, at least I can't, I can't see who's here. But we'll, we'll wait a few minutes and then we'll, we'll get started this evening and I just want to give some folks some time to jump on. Hey Leslie, good evening. Hey Austin, you've been enjoying the snow days, I'm sure. Hey Sam. Hey Rebecca. Joseph? Good, we got some folks coming in now. I figured I was a little little eager to get started and trying to get everything set up. Hey Bobby and Michelle. Tina and Mike. Good. All right. Well, a little bit different this evening, different setting, and certainly not the same as uh, getting together in person, and um, I really just didn't know what the conditions were going to be today. It's It's been pretty bad the last couple days, and um, I just didn't want anybody to have to risk, you know, making the choice of uh, putting themselves at risk or, or um, you know, coming to church, and so I knew that uh, we had the ability to meet on live stream and so I knew that we could we could still have church I didn't really want to cancel service two weeks in a row and not have anything and and uh, we still need to finish up from what we started two weeks ago and uh, so I didn't want us to get behind that way and, and I still wanted us all to have a chance to uh, to get together even if it's virtually and um, I know we have some like uh, Bonnie who um, just didn't feel safe coming all the way from Point Pleasant. I certainly understand that. And uh, Mary, who um, who said today that her, her driveway is still covered in snow and ice. And our parking lot, it started to clear up in the sunshine today, but um, I went out back and kind of walked around the building. And, and there's still some spots where the snow's melted, but there's ice underneath. So I just didn't, I don't know. I just... Um, and when I saw the sunshine today, I felt kind of bad for canceling service, but then I still think it was the, the right call, um, just because I, I just don't want anybody to get hurt. And so um, th this will work for this week, and, and I guess I, I saw on the news, they're saying that um, we get a pretty bad storm starting tomorrow night, uh, all through Friday, and even Friday night. So definitely don't want to cancel service on Sunday, uh, but we'll just see what happens. May not have a choice, but I hope not. And um, all right, we'll go ahead and get started here this evening. See, uh, Nana's here, Judy's here. So we'll give folks a, a little more time, but um, we'll just start with a word of prayer. And um, 
if you have any prayer requests, just put them down here in the comments and, and we'll see them and, uh, and then uh, we'll go to prayer and, uh, and then we'll get started in the study here. But let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Lord, and uh, I'm so thankful for um, the day that you've given us and, and so thankful that um, we really have the, the beauty of the snow. I know some people don't like it, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of the cold, but I do think that what you're able to do in nature and what you're able to do in your creation is just beautiful, and there's a, there's a peacefulness about the snow. And, and so, Father, I, I thank you for that beauty, and, and I thank you for keeping us all safe. And I thank you that even though we're not able to gather uh, in your house this evening, we're not able to be together in the building, we still have a way to be together uh, with one another and fellowship over the internet. Thank you that um, the, the technology gives us the ability to uh, to still have church. And uh, it's just an added benefit. We get to do it from the comfort of our own homes. And But Father, I just pray that um, within each of our homes and where we are, your spirit would be with us, that, um, that we would learn this evening, that we would... Uh, be sensitive to what you have for us, Lord, and that we would take it in and that we would apply it to our lives and, and that we would just genuinely be the kind of people, the kind of uh, Christians that you have called us to be, to be like Christ in this world and, and what it actually means to, to be a Christian. And, and I just pray that um, we would really take this message in, that we would live it, that we would not just hear it, but we would actually live it. And uh, Father, I just pray that you'd be with all those who are sick this evening, um, all those who are still maybe recovering from illnesses, Lord, and, and those that may be out on the road today and tomorrow, that you would just keep them safe. And Father, I just pray that, pray that you would bless our time together as we continue this study. And we ask all this in your precious holy name. Amen. All right, well, we are in the book of James. Um, that's what we started a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we didn't make it very far, and that's okay. We had a really good time of discussion um, when we, we started a couple weeks ago. We made it, uh, my plan was to get through verses 1 to 12, <clears throat> and we made it just to chapter, or verse 5. So we didn't make it very far, but there was a lot of really good discussion, which I, I don't know how that's going to work this evening, because I've got my notes in front of me here on my laptop, and then on this screen is where I can see your all's comments and and uh, any questions you might have or comments that you might have. So I can't really look in both directions at once. So if you see me looking this way, I'm looking at what you all might be typing. If you see me looking here, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. But um, I do, I, before we get into the lesson this evening, and, and we're going to pick up with verse 5, and that's where we'll, we'll start reading uh, out of the book of James this evening. But I just want to kind of review what we covered, um, the, the little bit that we did cover um, a couple weeks ago when we started. And so James is, is brutally honest in this, uh, in, the, in his letter here. Um, he is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, and they are facing persecution. They are kind of spread out. Um, the, the Christian family uh, has been spread out, um, whether that was because God had sent them on missions and, and sent them away from Jerusalem. Some of them are spread because of persecution. And so James is really writing to a people who are living the Christian faith. Um, I call it a, a faith with overalls, and that's a, that's a faith that works. I mean, it's it, this isn't hypothetical. This isn't what would you do if uh, James is writing to people who are going through difficulty, who are facing persecution, who are facing rejection, and really who are uh, new Christians. I mean, they, they are um, living this faith, and he is explaining to them how a Christian should approach life and how a, the, a real faith, a genuine faith, should work in the life of a Christian. And so right, right away he says, you know, suffering is going to come. He doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to uh, make the Christian life more than it is, and I think we sometimes tend to do that. We it's almost like we're trying to sell Jesus to people, and so we say, you know, all things are great. And 
the Christian life is good. I, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, we should go around with our heads hung low all the time. But we still have to live in this life. And, and living in this life, living in this world, means that uh, we, we live in a world that is hostile to God, hostile to the message of the gospel. And so we shouldn't be surprised if we encounter difficulty. And sometimes that difficulty is a result of living in a world that is lost in sin. And sometimes it's it's just life. I mean, life happens to Christians. Life happens to everybody. And we face hardship and we face difficulty and, and we face, um, you know, loss and pain and sickness. We face these things. And so really what James is doing is, is he's showing us well, how should we live? What should our response be uh, even as we live through this life? And so, again, he doesn't try to sugarcoat it. He's very honest and open at the front, and that is that trials will come. Um, we, we don't get an exemption because we're Christians to trials in this life. And, and so we shouldn't be surprised when we face trials and, and difficulties um, because that is just a part of living Life, but what James does is he he connects um, these trials and difficulties that we we face with the testing of faith, um, and and what James says is that the testing of our faith, the trials that we encounter, produces perseverance, and so it, it is uh, we encounter these things. We don't get an exemption from these things, but there's a purpose. Um, and, and perseverance is the idea of patience. You know, we, we learn to grow. And um, in, in verse 3, I, I mentioned this in our study, but it says the trying of our faith. That doesn't mean how, um, you know, sometimes we say that maybe our spouse tries our patience or our kids are trying our patience. That, that's not what James is referring to here. What the kind of trying that he's testing, what that word means in the Greek is is testing. And so... It's uh, what we the, the mental image and the word picture that James is really trying to paint here is is the trying of metal and so you know metal whether it's gold or silver or whatever when it comes out of the ground it has naturally in it impurities and so it has to be tempered or tested by fire and it is this testing process that actually purifies gold and so this is the idea that James is trying to give us is that these trials these difficulties, these hardships that we encounter, it, it purifies our faith. It gives us a, a pure faith, a stronger faith that we otherwise wouldn't get. Um, it, it's, it's just not possible to grow in faith uh, and grow our faith and sh have a strong faith if it's never tested, if it's never tried, if, it, if it's never um, confronted with difficulties in this life. I, I mentioned this quote from Winston Churchill in our first week, but I want to I want to mention it again. And, and I was talking about how, you know, even in, in trials and difficulties, we may want to feel like giving up, but we we shouldn't. And the quote from Winston Churchill is never yield to force, never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy, never give in, never give up, never, never, never. And so trials come into our life, difficulties come into our life, but we should not look to throw in the towel um, because we know that God is using these things uh, to make us stronger, to build our faith, to make us more mature and more Christ-like is, is ultimately the goal. Now, um, one other thing I want to mention before we move forward um, is, is the idea of perfection and uh, completeness and, and entirety. Um, in, in verse 4, uh, James writes, but let patience have her perfect work. And that's the perseverance that he was talking about. Patience, perseverance. Let her have her perfect work. Let, let these trials accomplish when, uh, within us what they need to accomplish within us, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, we get caught up on that word perfect. And uh, that word, um, we, we assume one thing and we assume it means one thing, but really it's, it's not the thing that James was trying to communicate because the Greek word there that James uses is teleos, and, and that just means mature or complete, um, initiated, fully developed, or formed. And so these things, it, it makes us perfect. These things will produce a perfect faith in us, but 
But again, that's not a flawless faith. It's mature. It, it's a maturing thing. It is a complete thing. Um, it is a fully developed or formed faith. And then entire, that word that, that James uses entire, is the Greek word holokleros, which means whole and complete or intact or blameless. And so if we really break down James's idea of perfect and how we should take it is that we come to Christ for salvation. We do this in faith. And that same faith that leads us to salvation is the same faith that is tried and made stronger by trials. Trials build patience. And this patience of faith makes us mature. And this maturity in Christ makes us whole. And so, you know, like so many other concepts in the Christian life, nothing is possible without Christ. If we are ever going to be perfect, it is only the perfection of Christ in us. It is not about what we do. It's not about who we are. It's about who we have placed our faith in. And this trying, this patience, this, this um, perfecting work uh, is is just making us more like Christ, and that is a process. But but this growing of faith only comes through trials, and uh, as we're going to talk about next week, temptation. But I do want us to focus on the idea of, of uh, the trials and continuing down this thought of what trials do in our life and what the purpose of them uh, in our life is. And so if you have your Bibles, we're in James chapter 1. And we are going to read verses 5 through 12, and, and uh, we, we're going to hopefully get through the, 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 less, the, the, the rest of this first lesson. That's, that's my goal for this evening anyway. Let me get a drink of coffee here. All right, James chapter 1, starting at verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not then it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So James spends those first uh, four verses Again, being brutally honest, that trials are going to come. We should not be surprised by trials and difficulties in this life. But they serve a purpose. And he even tells us what that pur purpose is, is to make us more mature, more fully developed, make us entire in Christ. Now, I suppose, you know, it, he could have just left the message there. He says, look, trials are coming. Trials will happen. You're enduring trials. They serve a purpose. And here's the purpose. And then he could have just moved on to the next thing. But, but James tells us where we can turn to in these trials. And, and he, he, he takes us on this journey of the reality of our situation, perhaps, what the purpose of our reality is and what we're dealing with. And then he says, by the way, you don't have to go through this alone. There, there is assistance in trials. And, and you have a, a friend, you have a refuge that you can turn to in your trials and in your difficulties. So you do not have to go through this alone. And so verse 5 makes it even more evident that this state of maturity and completeness really has nothing to do with who we are or what we do. Um, in our trials and in our difficulties, in living this life, when we don't know what to do, we lack wisdom, as James says there in verse 5. Well, then he reminds us where we can turn to. And he doesn't say, look to yourself. Don't look inward. Don't read a good motivational book. Don't uh, trust your heart or don't go with your guts or, or don't um, go with your instinct. James tells us quite clearly, quite plainly, to look to God, not to self, not to even perhaps past experience, but to look to God. And, and the answers to many of the problems that we face in this life can be found in God's Word. 
And, and if nothing else, I mean, and it's true, you know, you're not every problem, not every situation that we're going to face in this life is, is written out in black, white, and red in our Bible. But if nothing else, when we turn to God's Word, well, there's wisdom and there's comfort to be found there. We we read the promises of God's Word, and, and we see how He's dealt with people uh, in the past, and how I, I think the Psalms are a wonderful, uh, just brutally honest book. I mean, David was feeling things when he wrote the Psalms, and you know, that shows us that it's okay to feel, uh, it's okay to have emotion, but David always turned to God in, in his difficulty, in the low points of his life, he always turned to God, and, and he found comfort in, in the writings of God's Word, in the writings of the prophets, in the writings of the law. Jo, uh, David found comfort, and so again, this just shows us that when we don't know where to turn, when up is down, down is up, when right seems wrong and, and wrong seems right. When we don't know what to do, well, we can always turn to God's word. And, and notice that James tells us that the wisdom that God gives and, and, and what he says about it is that it will be given liberally, um, without reproach, which is what upbraideth means. Um, so when we ask God for guidance, he will give it. Um, and, and it, now I will say, it doesn't do any good to take something to God in prayer, to take a situation that we're facing to God in prayer, and then not listen to what God tells us to do through the Holy Spirit, or we take it to God in prayer, and then we don't give God a chance to answer us. Um, you know, spending a short amount of time in prayer. Um, just saying a quick prayer, and then you just expect everything to fall into place. And it's it's not communication with God. We're, we're not communicating with God at that point. We're just telling God what we want to see happen. But if we're facing a, a problem or a difficulty, we should come to God. We should take it before him in prayer, and we, we shouldn't be afraid to come before him in prayer. But there's another aspect to that kind of prayer that we often forget, and that is that we need to be silent. We need to be quiet and, and listen to, to God's word, what, what he has for us, what he has to say for us, that we need to be open to his wisdom. So, you know, yes, pray, uh, but what does that prayer look like would be my question. You know, if somebody says, well, I've been praying and praying and praying about this. Well, are you, are you taking time to listen? Um, are you taking time to really be quiet before God um, as, as the psalm, uh, psalmist tells us, be still and know that I am the Lord. There's, a, there's an imperative there. Be still. Be quiet. Um, we like to talk a lot. And sometimes we want to go to God and just you know, tell him all these things. And, and again, it's so often what we want to see happen. And yet how often are we quiet? And how often are we quiet before God in our prayer? And just allow the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and speak into our minds and speak into our lives and actually be receptive to what God has for us. But getting back to James here, that was a little bit of a tangent. But, um, you know, what James is saying is you never have to be afraid to come before God. You can come before God when you don't know what to do, when, when you know, experience fails you. All conventional understanding and wisdom fails you. You can come to God for his wisdom. And the wonderful truth that James presents to us here is that he'll give it. He will give it. When we ask God for guidance, he will give it. And when we come to God, and, and we may be at the end of our rope, maybe we have tried to do things our way and it's just fallen to pieces around us. Um, and maybe the situation just seems so... Um, overbearing, that we are just weighed down, and, and some people feel ashamed to go before God. Um, you know, if they try to do it their way, and it fails, or if they think that this is a situation that they should have seen coming, or if it's a result of their actions, and they feel guilty about those actions, well, they feel like, well, I can't go before God because, you know, this is too embarrassing. But what James tells us here is that, you know, we, we can come to God without reproach. He's going to give his wisdom without reproach. 
Um, he, he isn't going to look down on you or belittle you for not knowing what to do. He isn't going to make you feel bad for turning to him for wisdom and guidance and understanding. And so God desires to give us his wisdom. And this is because he's a giving God. Um, but we just need to seek it. I mean, God wants to give. He gives liberally. Um, this is an idea that's repeated uh, in, in Titus. In Titus, I believe it's uh, chapter 4. It's not in my notes. It's what I get for going off script. But I believe it's it's either Titus 3 or Titus 4 where he says, um, you know, he's talking about the, the washing of regeneration and, and the, the renewal of the Holy Spirit and the justification through Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says that God gives these things abundantly um, and he pours them out abundantly. Well, here James is saying the same thing. His wisdom, his guidance, his love, his mercy, he accepts, uh, he pours these out on, on us liberally. He gives them liberally. And so we just have to seek it. We have to sometimes... Often, we have to set our pride aside, um, admit that we don't know what to do, admit that we don't have an understanding and a full grasp of the situation. We have to set our pride aside, admit that we need God's help, and then be willing to actually take the help that he provides. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've, I've told this story or, or said this, but one of the, the best piece of, pieces of advice I ever got as a young man was from my stepfather. And, uh, and I was in some difficulty, I was in some trouble, and I just did not want to ask anybody for help. I mean, it just, it was so embarrassing to admit that I had misread the situation so badly and that now I was in this situation. And it, and it just really, it felt like everything was kind of crumbling around me. And, uh, and I just didn't want to turn to anybody. And finally, you know, when I just could not hold the pieces together anymore, I finally, you know, went and talked to him, talked to my mom and and, you know, he said, never let your pride get in the way of you getting the help that you need. Um, and, and so often we do that. We try to put on a, a strong front and a good face, and and we just think that we can do this. And then when it turns out wrong, well, it's a, it's a pride thing. And we don't want people to know that we messed up and that we made a mistake. But don't let your pride get in the way of you coming to God who loves you, who's your heavenly Father, who has promised in his word that he has wisdom for you and he will give it liberally. Never let your pride get in the way of receiving the help that God has for you, receiving the wisdom that he has for you, and then actually, you know, taking advantage of, of the help that he offers us. And so how, how do we ask for wisdom? That, that's perhaps the, the big question. How do we ask for wisdom? And James answers that question for us. You know, there, there are prerequisites for asking God for wisdom. So the first is we ask in faith. Um, we, we go to God in prayer and we believe that he hears us. Uh, we believe that he cares and we believe that he'll provide an answer for us because he's promised to. And, and we can't waver uh, in that faith, you know, in, in, in that idea uh, because Satan would love nothing more than for you um, to believe that prayer is pointless. Satan would love nothing more than for you to, to get up from prayer and your time in prayer with God, and then he'll put the little thought in your head, well, do you think God actually heard you? Do you think God actually cares about you? Do you think God, you know, does he have nothing better to do that, than to stop everything and listen to you and then provide some kind of way for you? And it is so easy when we feel surrounded by circumstance and surrounded by trials, sometimes that little thought is all it takes to get us off track. And so we stop praying and we because God just doesn't have time for me or God doesn't hear me or God doesn't care about me. And then now we're, we're spinning off into a, a really bad place where we are voluntarily cutting ourselves off from the one advocate and ally that we have. And so we cannot ever waver in our belief and in our faith that God hears us, that God cares about us, and that he's promised to answer. Now that answer may not come in, on our timetable, but he has promised an answer. Now James uses the metaphor of a wave that's blown and tossed on the sea by the wind to describe this person uh, uh, who will come to God but then I don't know if he actually hears me. I don't know if he actually cares. I don't know if this is doing any good. Um, you know, a wave that's tossed on the sea has, 
I, I'm sure we've we've all uh, been to the beach. The beach is one of my favorite places to go, and 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 one of my favorite things to do is just sit on the beach and watch the waves roll in. And uh, there seems to be a pattern to to how waves roll into the sea or into the coast, but really there's not. I mean, there, there's a lot of things that go into play there, but the wind is a big one. And the wind blows these waves in, and, and the wave has no choice in its direction. It has no way in which it's going. If the wind blows right, well, then those waves are going to move right. And if the wind blows left, well, then the waves are going to move that way. And, and James says, you know, the person that can set their pride aside and come to God and admit they need help and then tell God uh, what they need help with, but then doubt him, well, they're no better than you're just tossed about by the wind. And perhaps the wind of emotion is, is the better thing is, you know, when it feels good, well, we'll trust God. When things are difficult and we don't, we don't get an immediate response, well, then I don't know if he's really listening. And so we're just kind of blown about on the winds. And, and James takes a step further and says that person's really double-minded. Um, th this is a person whose emotions get in the way of their faith. And, and again, if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel good, if things aren't going the way we think they should, um, well, well, then, you know, we'll bring things to God. But, you know, if, if times are tough and God doesn't answer on, on my timetable and he doesn't give me, well, then I'm just going to take those things back. You know, God obviously, he, he must not care. Uh, or he's not working fast enough, so I've already tried things my way, but it's not working, but I'm just going to keep on trying to do it my way. But by, by the way, God, if you, if you want to help, then, then I would appreciate it. So I would just say, you know, for a double-minded person like that, it's really not a good place to be. And I would say that if you have enough faith to bring things to God in the first place, to humble yourself, to set your pride aside, bring things before God, well then you know, at a minimum, believe that he cares about you, believe that he hears you, and then have enough faith to trust in him to see you through and, and provide for you. And and when we turn to God for, for help, but we don't trust him, I, I think we're really, we can miss the whole point of the trial completely. Because again, if the point of a trial is to build our faith, um, to make us more mature in our faith, well then if, if we turn to him for help, and we come to him in prayer, but then we don't trust him enough to take the issue. We don't trust him enough to hear us. Well, then the, the, the trial is, is pointless. Um, and that's our fault. That's not God's fault. It's just our fault that we didn't have enough faith in him to, to live up to the promises that he gives us in his word. So the first key to asking for wisdom and how to ask for wisdom is to ask in faith, believe that God hears. Secondly, Live in the hope that comes with trusting God. Um, and you evidence that hope in your life uh, and how you live and how, you know, even in the midst of a trial, you can still hold your head up. And, and even in the midst of a trial, you can still believe that God is for you, not against you. And James says it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or poor, socially important, the lowest of the low. We have to see beyond our circumstances to the eternal advantages that we have through Christ. James tells us that we shouldn't put our hope in money and wealth because it fades and it withers like a flower in the sun. Those who are poor and humble of spirit can take hope in their high standing in the kingdom of God. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, nobody's going to have a bank account in heaven. And it doesn't matter one little bit to God about whether you're rich here in life and you have unlimited uh, financing to do whatever you want to do or if, if you barely have two pennies to rub together. Um, those that, and we think, I mean, our world tells us because our, our world is materialistic and our world tells us, well, if you've got money, then you're not going to have any problems. And if you've got money, you can take care of any problem uh, that comes along your way. James, just as Christ did in his ministry, tries to reframe that worldly materialistic thinking to say, really, it's you have to be poor of spirit and humble of, of spirit in order to know how high you actually are in the kingdom of God. And so we don't place our hope uh, in the things that we can see. We don't place, and, and what James is getting at here is not that, you know, to be wealthy is sinful. Um, that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is those that have great wealth, that's, that's what they tend to put their faith in. That's what they tend to trust in and, and believe in more than God. Because, again, money gives us this, this false sense of security and this false sense of power. 
And so we don't place our hope in the material things. We don't place our hope in our money and our bank accounts and, and the things that we can buy or the, the things that we can do. We have hope in eternal things and in the things of God. And that's, that's evidence of a faith that believes, is that we're able to, uh, you know, Hebrews 11 says that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Um, so we, we have hope and we place our hope in the things that we can't see. It's, it's eternal things. It's heavenly things. It's the things of God. And so we hope and trust in God and that um, that's the second key in asking for wisdom. The third step in asking for wisdom uh, is, is the person who asks for God's wisdom must remain steadfast and live a life full of love. Now, verse 12 uh, presents us with two paths. Um, perseverance, which is the result, the building of the faith through these trials. And, and this perseverance, to get there, it's a difficult path. The trials are not easy. It's a difficult path, but that path ultimately leads to life. And so we can either persevere in our faith we can grow and be matured in our faith, or we can surrender to temptation. And uh, temptation provides us with a faster, sometimes maybe easier path, but ultimately that path leads to destruction. Now next week we're going to talk more about temptation because uh, in the third or the second part of, of this first chapter, James spends a lot of time talking about temptation. But, you know, really it's, we can either do things God's way and sometimes that way is difficult, and, and maybe it doesn't go as quickly as we would like, and, and it is a difficult path, but we know that God's way ultimately leads to life, or we can give in to temptation. And that temptation is, it's easier. Um, it's, it's perhaps a quicker route to the things we think we need, the things we think we want, um, but ultimately, the path of temptation leads to sin, and, and the path of sin, the wages of sin, is death. So in, in times when life is good and we aren't facing problems, well, this choice seems easy. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, when, when it's easy to follow and, and, and life is good and you know, everybody's healthy and the sun's shining and, and things are great, well, of course I'm going to follow the Lord because it's easy. You know, it's good. It's it's a uh, this is what it's all about but it's a completely different story when a storm hits or when a problem hits you're at the end of your rope and it feels like the walls are just absolutely closing in around you um, there's nothing like pain and I mean a physical pain uh, from illness or uh, you know the just the reminder that our bodies aren't as strong as they used to be and the pain that is constant and and never lets up and, and and a mental pain you know mental anguish uh that doesn't let up discomfort conflict uncertainty uh, of, of what is going to happen next there's nothing like those things that will make you look for the easy way out <laughs> in the blink of an eye you know and i i think of you know, pain or conflict you know i, I don't like conflict um i believe in stating the truth uh, even when that truth is unpleasant but I don't go looking for conflict, you know. I don't looking. I don't go looking to get into arguments with people, and and um, you know sometimes if we're faced with the idea of conflict, well, we're going to look for the easy way out. And sometimes that's to just keep our mouth shut and our head down and not stand up for what we believe, not stand up for what we think the truth to be, and and we're just going to get through this. Uh, but certainly pain. I mean, and if you know intense physical pain that just doesn't let up, you know that you're going to look for relief from that pain. But we, we have to remain steadfast in our faith. Um, you know, and, and we have to trust in God because he's the only one that offers life. And, and this choice to remain steadfast, it's one that needs to be made in the good times. Uh, when, when the sun is shining and everybody's healthy and you feel good and everything is, is just coming up your way. I mean, that's when you decide, hey, you know, even if, my whole situation, my whole circumstance were to change overnight, I am still going to follow the Lord. Uh, because when trials and difficulties come, um, you're going to be tempted uh, to do, take the easy way out. And it's it, unless you decide when in the good times that you are going to remain faithful and remain true to the Lord, 
Well, when those difficulties come, if, if you make that choice in the good, well, there's going to be no question about where your loyalty lies, who you'll turn to, uh, that you're not going to rely upon yourself. So our lives, regardless of circumstances, uh, regardless of what we're going through, uh, regardless of what we're dealing with, must also be a life that demonstrates love. Um, it, it is our love for God that enables us to go through, withstand trials. Um, and, and because we love him and we know that he loves us and we have put our faith in him, then, then we can rest our confidence in him. Uh, and we can know that he's never going to um, disappoint us or abandon us. And, and that's because we love him. And we've felt his love for us. And, and our love for God is demonstrated, I think, the best when we make the choice to worship him and stay true to him and follow him, even in the midst of trials and life difficulties. Look, you can't control what happens in your life. Not always. I mean, sometimes things happen, and it's beyond your control. And, and you, you know, if you could change it, you would. But things happen. So you can't always control what happens in your life, but you absolutely can control how you respond to what's happening in your life. And I know that sounds like some motivational book sales pitch, but you know what I mean by that is I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I have no idea. I have a plan for tomorrow. I know what I want to get accomplished tomorrow. I know what I want to do, but I cannot st uh, sit here and tell you that that's what's going to happen because I just don't know. So we can't control what happens in our life, but we can decide, we can choose right now in this moment that regardless of what happens tomorrow, for good or for bad, we are absolutely going to trust God. and We're going to place our faith in him. And regardless of what happens, we are going to serve him. We're going to worship him. We are going to love him just the same. And so that, that's our choice. And, and asking for God's wisdom, when we, when we ask for God's wisdom with faith and hope and love, well, that brings not only the blessing of wisdom, but also the blessing of, of winning. I mean, God has promised that those who overcome trials with faith, I mean, this is, this is how uh, verse 12 ends. Uh, verse 12, James says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. You endure to the end. You make it through. You come out on the other side of that storm. You endure to the end. For when he is tried, uh, sorry, I lost one. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So there is a, there is a promise waiting for the person who overcomes. Now, again, we don't overcome by our own power. We don't overcome by our own authority. We don't overcome by our own wisdom. We, we overcome trials, and as we're going to see Next week, we overcome temptation in this life through the grace of God and with his help. So when we learn to uh, rely on his strength and not ours, when we overcome the trials in our life with a faith in him and hope in him and a love for him, well, there's a crown of life that's waiting in heaven for those that will overcome and those that do overcome. Now, look, God knows this life is not easy. That is one of the great things, the, the great realities that the, re, the, the truth of Jesus Christ and his life on this earth reminds us of, is that he lived this life. He was tempted in all ways, and yet sinned not. And so God knows how difficult this life can be, and how difficult this life may be, and he knows how difficult trials can be, and he knows how strong temptation can be. And he knows that trials are going to come to his children. He knows that we're going to face these things and, and, and face an uncertain future. He knows that. But he promises us in his word here in James, not only his wisdom, which, again, remember, he'll give liberally, and he's not going to reproach you for seeking his wisdom and not knowing what to do. But he promises us his wisdom, but he also promises us a reward for those who overcome and press on in their faith. And, and of course, you know, the, the real reward is that maturity, maturity, excuse me, that maturing, um, having a stronger faith, 
seeing God's word prove true in our life, that's a reward. There's also the reward of heaven that we know is waiting for us. But then on, on top of all that, I mean, there's this reward that, hey, God's going to have something for you. And, uh, and I think that that's just uh, incredible. And um, so it is possible. I don't know what some folks may be facing this evening. I, I don't know. Um, you know, there, there may be job problems. Um, there, there may be marriage problems. There, it may just be life, financial problems. Uh, conflict within the family and, and it just seems like you're, you're at the end of your rope um, I would encourage you to to take it to the Lord in prayer there, there's a song that says I'm not going to try to sing it but take it to the Lord in prayer and maybe you're thinking well pastor I, I have I mean I've been praying about this situation at my job I've been praying about this um, issue between me and my spouse and just nothing nothing seems to to be working out. Um, I don't think God hears. Well, I hope if you heard nothing else I've said this evening, I hope you you have heard that God does hear you. Uh, and God cares. And, and God is there for you. Um, he wants to give you his wisdom. And he is going to see you through this trial. And uh, I believe I, I mentioned it was either Sunday morning or Sunday night. I don't remember one uh, in my evening or morning service, but it, it was that, you know, we can't put God on a timetable. Um, and anytime we try to kind of shoehorn God into our timetable uh, and well, God, I want you to do this at this time, you know, right now, well, we're, we're probably going to be disappointed every time because God doesn't factor time the same way we do. And so, you know, I know, um, when we're in trials and difficulties, we, we want it to end now. Um, but God doesn't, God doesn't guarantee us a, a quick end to trials, but he does promise his wisdom and strength to make it through the trials. And uh, I just want to close this evening and wrap up. Uh, there's, a, there's a song that my family sings, and, and um, I've, I've heard it from the time I was little. And so when I was little growing up, I just I kind of thought, well, this is the family theme song. You know, and I, I thought every family just had a, a theme song. Uh, the reason I thought that was, uh, you know, we sing it at family gatherings. Most of the time when, when all the family gets together, we sing it. Um, we, we sing it on holidays. Um, I can recall many times singing it in hospital waiting rooms when a family member was sick in the hospital or recovering from surgery. We would sing it. We've, we've sung it at funerals. We've sung it by grave signs. Um, and it's an old song. I, I couldn't find it in any of the song books. Um, it's an old song. The title of the song is I Just Heard From Heaven. And I'm going to have to sing it, I guess, one, one Sunday uh, for, for church. I'll have to be the special one Sunday and sing it. But it's a good song. But the second verse um, of that song says this. Trials come to you and me, burdens hard to bear. But our heartaches, grief, and pain, he will gladly bear. So just look up and trust in him and leave your burdens there. And you will hear from heaven when you call in prayer. Trials, pain, heartache, grief, burdens. We will encounter all of these things in our lives. And being a Christian doesn't put us above these experiences. But being a Christian does give us a hope in these trials. And uh, to, to have the right attitude in trials, you have to see the advantage of trials. You have to see the benefit of trials. They're not to break us. They're not to beat us down. They're to build us up. So if you are experiencing trials this evening, if you're going through something, and we're all facing something, let's just be honest, we're, we're all facing something in our life. Well, ask for help. Ask for help. Ask for God's wisdom in your trials. Seek after him with a peace of mind, a, a, a hope that he hears, and, and know that you're loved by him. If you do this, you'll find that you can rejoice in trials, be blessed by enduring them. Your faith will grow and mature. Um and God doesn't send trials into our life to break us, to beat us down, to, to take us down a peg. 
Trials come because life is hard. Trials come because circumstances are difficult. But in the midst of those things, God is still good. God still loves you. God still loves us. And, and again, it's so often just a matter of setting our pride aside and admitting that we need help. So uh, that's where we're going to end it this evening. Um, I did it. I made it through the, the last uh, section there. Um, I, I had this plan. I, I think I said this the first week. You know, I had this plan that, you know, James is a relatively short book. It's only five chapters. And I thought, well, you know, we can just do a chapter a week and, and um, you know, we can get this done in, in uh, five weeks and then move on to the next, which I don't, at this point, I don't know what the next thing is because I sat down thinking, you know, if we would get through this quickly, which is what I was afraid of, uh, which we didn't because I'm long-winded and I know I am, but um, I was working on what would have been tonight's lesson and that'll be next week. It's all messed up, but... I found we're, I don't think we're ever going to finish chapter one next week um, because that, James is just one of my favorite books, and I knew going into into this that um, you know I was gonna I was just going to try to uh, get all the meat off the bone, so to speak, and um, and so we're going to pick up next week, um, and uh, we'll, we'll see how far we get. But uh, I appreciate everybody uh, joining me, um, you know, making the decision to cancel in-person service is never an easy one um and but it's so good to see so many of you um what's that sam said caleb said if you want to sing that song as a congregational it's probably in the highest key ever yeah i think um i don't know what key it's actually in i don't know what key we sing it in but i know i have to i have to drop it down and, and that's the benefit of playing guitars i can put it in whatever key is comfortable for me but uh, anyway, I appreciate appreciate you all uh, being here. This really does it. It takes me back to uh, back in the pandemic, kind of how my ministry started was not being able to be in church and and uh, all we had was live stream. And uh, I I wanted to do something. Um, I wanted to give people a place where they could come and and feel a little uplifted. And so I would often turn to uh, Facebook, you know, live and and I would just do devotionals. And so this is kind of, it takes me back to, you know, talking to myself, but uh, knowing that I have friends out there and, and folks that are listening. And so I, I, I hope that this has been beneficial to uh, you all. I hope that this has helped you. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I turn into, uh, in the wintertime, I turn into something like an amateur meteorologist. And I'm constantly checking the radar and anytime I hear this, because I, I really don't like snow and I don't like the cold. So I, I do know... Um, Tomorrow night, there's supposed to be another storm front that moves in. It's supposed to dump, you know, I think three to four to five inches uh, through the day. And then uh, Friday night, we're supposed to get another inch or two. And uh, it's going to stay cold. Uh, so we'll see. Um, we'll see. I, I really don't want to cancel Sunday services. And that, that will be a uh, last resort kind of thing. But we'll see. It might be unavoidable, but I, I hope not and I pray not. But uh, thank you all for being here this evening. And uh, I think teachers and students are going back to school tomorrow. At least Courtney and Chris are. They're on a two-hour delay. So just be careful. If you have to go out, it's, it's going to be cold, if nothing else. So just bundle up tight. And um, just know that I love you. Uh, love being your pastor. I uh, love getting to uh, minister with you and to you. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, I just pray that uh, you have a good evening. And um, hope to see you all on Sunday. I'll pray a quick prayer dismissal, and then um, I'll, I'll give you all back your uh, give you all back your evening. But again, thank you for being here. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. I thank you for this time that we've had together. Uh, thank you for the truth of your Word. Thank you that um, we do not have to go through this life alone, and that difficulties and trials may come, and and it may seem like um, it's more than we can handle, and perhaps it is. But you don't leave us without a hope. Um, you you sent us your Son. In, in in Jesus we can have salvation, we can have justification, uh, and we can have a renewed life, and then we get the added benefit of the Holy Spirit that, that communicates and testifies with our spirit that we are your children. And so, Father, when we are faced with trials and difficulties, we never have to be ashamed uh, of turning to you 
of not being strong enough, uh, because we're not. But you are our Heavenly Father, and you have promised to be with us through the trials of this life, that you have wisdom for us, strength for us, that you want to help us to grow, and that you'll never abandon us, and you're never going to leave us, you're never going to forsake us, and that we can turn to you in our trials and difficulties, and we can find a refuge there, we can find strength there, we can find love there. So, Father, I, I pray for all those uh, who tuned in this evening. Father, I just pray you keep them safe, that you keep them warm, and that, Father, if it be your will, you bring us together again in person, uh, where we look forward to worshiping you in fellowship with one another. We ask all of this in your precious holy name. Amen. Have a good night. Uh, hope to see you all on Sunday. Thanks for being here. It means a lot. And uh, I love you. God loves you. Have a good night.